All right, I want to talk a little bit about the characteristics of stormwater and how it, um, I suppose, how that informs water sensitive urban design. And you'll notice here that um, I've listed this as three stormwater. And the reason for this is that typically when we think of the urban water system, we think of one, water supply, two, wastewater, and three, stormwater. In some ways, stormwater is a bit of the poor cousin. But it's really important to, for us to always have a mind as to how these three elements interact with each other. And we'll, we'll come back to that. So the typical approach to managing stormwater is essentially to try to get rid of it. So we create impervious areas so that it runs off. We then create constructed drainage systems so that we discharge it uh, directly into receiving waters uh, in order to get rid of it. But as you can see from that uh, photo, uh, this has really direct consequences in terms of degradation of those uh, receiving waters and degradation of the water quality and the flow regime in them. So we see changes to hydrology, we see changes to water quality, the changes to hydrology change the hydraulics, so we start to erode the channel, move sediments, etc. so we change the geomorphology. And it should be no surprise if we change those other three above, of course, our ecosystem is going to be uh, very substantially affected. And those effects are not just going to be local, they're going to propagate downstream uh, into our embayments, etc. And that, this results in a loss of uh, ecosystem services. Okay, let's talk a little bit about those uh, changes in hydrology. So in a natural catchment, we've talked a little bit about this before, we see uh, any water that manages to make its way through the canopy uh, and is not uh, transpired back up, we see most of that water soaking into the soil and then uh, coming out into the groundwater in weeks, months, years, decades, even centuries and there are studies that show uh, that use isotopes to age groundwater and find groundwater that's 80, 90 years old. Um, but when we, uh, and so imagining, you know, that's, that means that that water's had 80 or 90 years of treatment through the uh, ground before it gets into the receiving water. When we create impervious areas and drainage systems, we basically uh, completely shortcut that that water will travel from that impervious area into that receiving water within minutes. And we, we therefore see, um, you know, the sort of changes you would expect to see in terms of very uh, much less filtration, a lot of uh, degradation of water quality, any pollutants that are on that site transported directly in. And by definition, uh, we now see instead of this very flat kind of contribution of water over those weeks, months, years, we now see this really peaky uh, response. And so my colleague, uh, Matthew Burns from the University of Melbourne, uh, he did a nice study of um, two catchments to the east of Melbourne, uh, a natural catchment, Alinda Creek, where we can see uh, we have this really nice uh, base flow contribution. So that steady base flow I was talking about, that groundwater contribution, uh, and uh, so this, I should say, this is, these two graphs are from exactly the same period. They have essentially the same climate. They're right next to each other. One's urban on the right, one's natural on the left. And in a natural catchment, we see very muted response to rainfall, very small response. In the urban catchment, we see a really sharp, peaky response. And so two things occur to me. If I was an organism in that stream, I see that during the time when it isn't raining, I basically don't have a wa enough water to sustain my habitat anyway. So I'm likely to get uh, become extinct because I just don't have enough water. And then when it does rain, the flow is so great that all of my habitat that forms my, my house, let's call it, uh, gets washed away. So either way, I don't have uh, much hope. And here's some work by um, uh, another colleague, uh, Christopher Walsh, very, very well known uh, stream ecologist uh, in a paper published in PLOS One uh, that shows um, the same thing in this time for a number of catchments. So again, we've got a Linda Creek that I talked about before uh, in the, the red and Sassafras in the blue that are similar. 
So these are both natural catchments. And you'll see, again, two things to be noted. One, a very nice, steady base flow all of the time and very low response to those rainfall events that we see up above. And in the case of something like Brushy Creek, which is very urbanized, uh, we see much lower base flow and really sharp response to rainfall. And the catchment little stringy bark creek, which is kind of in between the two, it's uh, peri-urban, uh, semi-developed, fairly developed, but not as much as Brushy Creek. Uh, it's behaving uh, somewhere in the middle. Okay, and so that increased frequency of peak flows that we just saw before, uh, in, a, in a typical natural state, any sort of surface runoff might only happen a few times a year, depending on the climate and the soil, the slope, etc. It may only happen one, two, zero, three, four, five times a year, um, meaning that the ecosystem has a fair bit of time to recover. In the case of, say, Melbourne, for example, where it rains about 120 times a year, and I give this uh, talk right in the middle of winter when, when I'm a bit sick of it raining and being cold, uh, we get uh, those discharges, those peaks going into the stream something like 100 times a year. So it's very unlikely that an ecosystem has time to kind of recover when basically if you take the average, it's happening every three or four days. So what are some principles of good stormwater management? These are probably not exhaustive, but they're the principles that uh, Frederick and I have developed and, and think are a good way to start uh, thinking about how to manage stormwater well. So the first is to consider the nature of the receiving water. In a headwater stream, so these smaller sort of streams which uh, have fairly low flow volumes, they have very little buffering capacity, both against changes to flow, but also changes to pollutant concentration. And so we need to think about setting targets and, and putting in place systems that can maintain that flow regime in a uh, fairly natural state and maintain the water quality uh, in a state where we don't get these spikes in concentration. By the time we get down to our really large systems out, so our you know, very large rivers, our, our kind of lentic, almost lentic systems, estuaries, lakes, bays, etc., uh, they have much greater volumes of water sitting in them. And so they have much greater buffering capacity, both in terms of the sort of hydraulics, so the impact of flow regime on their hydraulic behavior, uh, but also their, um, uh, their pollutant concentrations. They're unlikely to see a big spike in concentration from a rainfall event. But what we will see is this long-term accumulation of uh, pollutants. And so we might think about targets there that are more about long-term loads. Well, the second principle, and we've alluded to this, is to now think about stormwater as a resource because we've already identified, we've already established that our receiving waters are suffering because there's too much water. There's an excess of water. They're getting too much runoff. Sure, they're dry during uh, dry weather flows, but overall, the volume of runoff is far in excess. Typically in an urban area, it might be over the year five or 10 times what it naturally would have been. And that means that we have this excess that potentially harvesting that could have a big benefit from the receiving, for the receiving water, but it could also benefit us. Here's some work done by um, uh, Mitchell and others a uh, number of years ago, uh, looking at the amount of water supply, wastewater and stormwater for various cities in Melbourne. Uh, this dates back a fair while, but the more recent data shows the same sort of picture. What is important, and I'm near to Melbourne, so I'm, uh, I'm circling that one. Um, what we see is that the amount of stormwater is very similar to, and in many places exceeds, the total demand for water. And so it gives us a sense of the magnitude of this resource that uh, we could be uh, thinking about. And the important thing is that uh, harvesting that water allows us to bring some of those you know, peak flows down closer to the natural level. And so we, if we see this con sort of conceptual diagram here, got a natural state sitting at, that should actually be one, that something's happened to the axes, sitting at one. Uh, when we develop it, we get a really big increase. 
And uh, when we harvest it, potentially, if we design it, we can get it closer, back closer to the natural. So we're going to see less of that ecological degradation as a result. 